Riesling for breakfast. Riesling, do that too. All right, good morning, everyone. We'll just wait for a couple, uh, a minute here just for everyone to log in. Hmm. That recently good. good. Good way of getting some a little bit of delivery of wine for the shelter in place drinking. I'm so happy to hear the birds in the background of your place, Steve. Birds are just loving the oh, spring. Yeah. It's nice we got this a clear our, clear day. Our too. property is you know has these old trees around the old house and and so it's this little bird haven, bird stop off yeah. place because you know, they get through all the miles of vineyards and all sides and they just are attracted to our little clump of trees. We, it's just loaded with birds. It's great. It's really fun watching the, I mean, I'm not a bird watcher, so I don't know what any of the birds are called, but as the year goes on, you see all these different birds and a lot of little, little ones migrating through. And it's really, it's neat. Now, now it's been enough years, you get the pattern and you go, oh, here's the ones with their yellow heads or here's the robins or, they come and they're here for a week or two and then they move on. It's pretty cool. That's great. Um, okay. Katie, do you want to go ahead yep. and get started? Great. Good morning and uh, welcome everyone to the very first installment of California Wine Institute's Behind the Wines webinar series <laughs> with our host, Elaine Chacon Brown. So each week for the next four weeks uh, and hopefully beyond, Elaine will be chatting with one of California's top winemaking and viticulture talents. And uh, we know there's been a lot of disconnect with so many of us staying at home and practicing, you know, various degrees of self-isolation. So we're taking the opportunity to bring some news from California's wine cellars to our international audience. So today to kick off the series, we are privileged to welcome Steve Mathiason of Mathiason Wines as our guest. Uh, but before I turn it over to Elaine, um, just a couple of housekeeping reminders for everyone. So please make sure your lines are muted. Um, there is a chat section as well as a Q&A section, which we encourage you to use. So keep in mind these are different. The chat section is more of an informal way for you to communicate with other participants. And the Q&A section is where we'd like you to submit your questions for Elaine and Steve to answer towards the end of the webinar. And we will do our best to address them all, um, but do keep in mind we have <coughs> A very a large number of attendees, which is great. Um, so please bear with us. So this session will be recorded and there will be a replay available on the California Wine Institute YouTube channel. And we'll also follow up with an email to attendees with the link to this video and information about next week's webinar. So now I'd like to introduce our host, Elaine, who doesn't need much of an introduction. Uh, she's a wine writer and educator. She serves as the American specialist for JancisRobinson.com and as contributing writer to Wine and Spirits magazine, as well as many other respected publications. Um, she works with the Wine Institute as our resident California wine expert, hosting master classes for international trade guests who visit California, as well as for Wine Institute activities abroad. So she was the clear choice to host this webinar series and we're thrilled to have her involved. So I'll leave it to you, Elaine, to introduce Steve and the topics that are on the menu for today. Thank you so much. I, um, let me get myself switched over here. We're all gonna kind of um, work this out as we go a little bit, but um, I, I just really wanna thank all the participants for calling in. We looked through the registration list and incredibly, <laughs> to be honest, it makes me a little emotional, but there are people from at least 20 countries that are signed in, which is pretty incredible. A um, special shout out to Cameroon. I didn't expect to see Cameroon registered, but we have someone from Cameroon actually participating right now, which is really quite amazing. And I just wanna say that, you know, in the midst of everything happening globally, to be able to connect with so many people all truly all over the world. It's really quite an honor and it, it means a lot to me. So thank you for that. Um, I 
am really incredibly thrilled to um, to have Steve here. And um, Steve, you know, we're we're lucky enough to be able to see you right there in your yard uh, with the redwoods behind you. Um, one of the things I know, you know, people calling in from all over the world, we not everybody knows what's going on in vineyards right now. Why don't you go ahead and just give us an update? You know, we're here in April finally, and things are starting to grow. So how, how's it looking there in the vineyard? Looking great. Um, we've had a really nice, we've only had three nights that were a little frosty and they weren't bad. Um, we were nervous this year because of the, we had a very dry February, but we've, we got some nice rain over the last few days that filled the soil back up. So we, we have, our spring growth hopefully is gonna happen really well um where our shoots i'll show you in a minute but our shoots are about this long so we're just we finished all our pruning we finished all our tying we're doing some tractor work under vine cultivation for weeds but we're um but now that's on hold because of the rain so now we're just sort of waiting for shoot thinning um we are fortunate because all of our employees in the vineyard are year round they all live here in napa so the so with the closed borders and all that are, aren't really affecting our vineyard labor at all. We all our long-term employees are all safe. No one's um, unwell. We're all um, you know we're all just kind of plugging along. We're considered an essential business, so for farming you can't stop that. And it's a very safe place to be out in the vineyard. It's fresh air. You're separated from people, so it's um, been a real um, sanity for us, for all of us, to um, just be working in the vineyard and doing our normal rhythm that we um, that we love every year of following the seasons and just doing our thing out in nature and um, pretending that, um, that there's no such thing as news and we're just in our little bubble. And so that's really nice. Um, the winery is, um, you know, the nice thing about a winery is that we are used to keeping, keeping things clean. So sanitation where is, you know, is paramount at all times for the wine anyways. And so we already have a ton of, of, um, protocols in place to keep our wine safe so now we have to keep our you know everyone working in the winery safe as well but we know how to do that and so we're spread out and we're still bottling and racking and doing our thing just more spread out now and so so it's again with the, between the winery and the vineyard it's, it's it's sort of like a normal spring and a, and a really nice spring and so we're just um trying to stay there basically and focus on what's right in front of us well, and you and I spent a bunch of time on the phone last week and, you know, you, you've put a lot of work into keeping your full-time employees and, and shifting to online options like what we're doing now so that people that want to taste Matthias and wines with some insight can actually do that with your, with your tasting room team still, but from home. Yeah, it's actually a, um, a kind of a strange silver lining because, you know, Napa Valley, people obviously come from all over the world wine tasting. And so our tasting rooms are a really important part of our business. Um, and so now with our tasting room being closed, our, we said, what are we going to do with our hospitality um, person? And she is doing Zoom tastings and it's actually allowing people that normally wouldn't be able to come here um, because everyone can't afford or take to come to Napa or take the time to come to Napa. And so people are, are now doing tastings from wherever they live and people, friends are joining in on Zoom and doing tastings together. We sent these tasting packs out and it's, um, I think that when everything gets quote unquote back to normal, we're probably gonna just keep on doing that and it's gonna be a more sustainable or sort of less carbon footprint way of people um, have, connecting with us and, and getting a taste through our wines with us. Well, and especially when we can see, you know, how beautiful it is here in California, like we are right now. Could you, you know, we, we got you set up so that we could see the vineyard too. Could you want to run over there and show us how the vines yeah. are doing and yeah, we can talk through some farming stuff? Okay, I'm going to mute Steve on his laptop and we're going to actually go over to his vineyard view, which I'm really excited we were able to get set up. It's, it's such a nice opportunity for for all of us stuck at home right. to see how the vineyards are doing. Can you hear me? Yeah, I got, I got you on okay. audio. So here's where we are right now with, with spring growth. These vines we're looking at are Rafosco. So this is our backyard. And and so one of the things see... I want to point out here, a lot of us know this already, of course, but one of the things that's great about Matthiasen, they're, they're working with really distinctive, uh, 
varieties from northeastern Italy, but right there in their backyard in Napa Valley. So we're getting to see some of that right now. Yeah. Um, yeah, this one's Rifosco. It's Rifosco Nostrano. Um, for a little further back there is um, Cabernet Franc. I'm going to pan over here. Hopefully it's not too pixelated. And over that's Schio Patino. This row is Schio Patino. If you see our barn, behind the barn is Rabola Gialla. And then if I keep panning, there's a vineyard over there in front of the olive trees. That's all Cabernet Franc. So it's, uh, each row is a different um, selection. So I did kind of a selection masal per row. It's, we're really that's excited great. about that one. That's great. That's a new trellis uh, uh, over there that's sort of adapted to um, climate change. It's very wide cross arms. So the fruit stays um, covered from the sun. And so and we're really happy with it. And we're probably going to be adapting more and more trellises to that. Well, and, you know, you're, you're really helping us to figure out how to farm these unique varieties in California. But the other thing that you're really known for is innovating on better farming practices that are more regenerative, but also better adapted to changing climate conditions. And with these, these vines here, you know, we can see you've done some under row cultivation. Can you talk to us, you know, because you are doing organic farming, how have you made those changes to manage water use and, and weed control there. Okay, so we, we switched this vineyard to no-till, converted to no-till about four years ago, with the idea being to, um, we want to have perennial grasses that sequester carbon deep into the soil. Um, this vineyard was established, the rootstock was chosen back in the mid 90s in this vineyard. People, people weren't thinking about that and they weren't thinking about water conservation. And so it's a more, um, so the idea in the 90s was you want lower vigor rootstocks for better wine quality because so the vines have to work harder for their water. So converting this to no-till, um, you, you obviously the grasses use water and so there's less water available to the vines. A certain amount of that is good for quality. The vines, you know, they're 25 years old, the, the roots are down, but we still have found here that we need to cultivate somewhat. So we're, we're cultivating directly under the vines. So you can see it's a pretty wide swath under the vines, but this is all cultivated. So that the so that the all the water directly under the vines can go to the go to the to the vines themselves, and then we're leaving it no till in the middles. So um, these grasses these are um, they just look like a lawn obviously, but the grass species are really important. And there are four different California native grasses here. The, the natives are adapted to our climate. In you know California, we get no water in the summer, really no rainfall in the summer at all. Um, all of our rain is in the winter. That's, that's our, we have a very extreme um, difference between winter and summer in California. So when, when we say no rain, and I'm not, it's not an exaggeration, we will not get rain during the growing season. And so all of our water to the vines is, was held in the soil from the winter. We get a lot of rain in the winter. And so it's, it's I, I always say we have two, um, two climates in California, Ireland and Spain. So it's, um, <laughs> You know, it's green and lush right now because we're coming out of the winter and then all this grass will turn golden and, and be dry all summer. And the California natives are adapted to that. They're, so they get the roots down six to eight feet into the ground. So that's sort of like two meters for everyone else. Um, and so you can, you can imagine all that carbon they're pulling out of the air. They're sticking way deep in the ground and up where it's going to be locked in there for a long, long time. And so that's kind of, that's, that's what we're trying to do in all of our vineyards and take, you know, use our land to, sort of sequester carbon. Well, and one of the um, things that's cultivated. one of the things that's really important there, you know, until recently we believed that actually only trees were effective at carbon sequestering and that's part of why people talk about preserving forests so much. But more recently we've actually discovered that grass, you know, old growth grass so to speak, does an incredible job at sequestering carbon in just exactly the way you're talking about cuz actually Grassroots are far, far deeper than we used to understand, and they, the the native grasses, like what you're growing there, do an incredible job pulling carbon deep into the soil, and and that actually ultimately benefits mm -hmm. the plants you're growing too. So it's a great, um, it's great that you're moving to no-till. Let's go ahead and get you back to the table though, so that we can talk about the wines um, that we're going to look at today too. Okay, turn this off. Okay, great. Just going to get back on Steve's um, 
Redwood view. So we pulled together um, three different wines. And one of the things that we wanted to do today is really look at, you know, part of the spirit of California wine is really a sense of mentorship, innovation, and collaboration. And so I asked Steve if he could pick one of his wines that uh, he wanted to feature, but also pick some wines from other producers that Steve knows well and, and talk through that, you know, the excitement of California across multiple regions, but also those kinds of relationships that people share in winemaking. And so the first wine that that you picked, Steve, is, um, let's see, the lighting's a little awkward here, but, um, so Benevolent Neglect is a new brand, newer brand. Do you wanna tell us about um, the work that they're doing? And we'll um, pour yeah. some of that wine. So, um, so um, this, is, this is a project by um, a couple younger guys who have been working in the um, wine industry, working in cellars. One of them was working in cellars, one of them was working in a tasting room. They're passionate about wine. They're, um, scrappy, they have no money, and so they've had to just keep their day jobs and so, sort of build this this um, brand on the side, which is the same way that we built Matthias in, but that was, you know, getting on 20 years ago now. And, um, and um, they, so they're just, it's a lot of hustle, basically, and they've gone and they've found vineyards all over California that have um, really exciting grapes, really cool sites that um, were sort of have been undiscovered. And so that, that what's happening a lot in California with the newer brands is I call it great prospecting is that people search around at some of the more offbeat areas. Um, and, and there, there are a lot of vineyards. I don't know if everyone understands that Napa Valley is only 4% of the wine made in California. So the 96% is outside Napa Valley. And a lot of these regions um, don't have much of a name, but they have their spots with really great soils, really, cool older vines and um and and not a lot of market for their grapes in many cases a lot of the grapes in different parts of the state have been going to the bigger brands as sort of like filler and and some neat old vineyards that um really could stand on their own and so so benevolent neglect they found this recently and they found an old vineyard up in mendocino county which is um two counties north of us goes napa sonoma mendocino and mendocino county is great um Great climate, great soils. The, the problem it has is that it's a long drive to get there for most of the wineries. And so it's always been sort of the last place is signed on to sell grapes and the first place people cut just because it's further afield. But it has a very long grape growing tradition just as long as really Napa or Sonoma. So you have these hidden gems up there. So they managed to find this old Riesling vineyard. Um, well, and, and Riesling's actually, Mendocino is quite important for California Riesling. I some a lot of people don't realize this but the first wine that Monteleda ever made um was actually Riesling and they they that fruit came from Mendocino and they're still actually working with the same vineyard up there there's actually a good amount of old vine Riesling in Mendocino which is I think pretty unexpected California lore and th this particular vineyard from Benevolent Neglect they're working with the Nelson family who are who are awesome old school farmers from California. They're farming produce and wheat and um, other crops as well as the grapes. And these vines were actually planted in 1974. But it's an awesome wine too. It's really got that, that innate concentration that you get from older vines, but then rip in acidity. And they've done a nice job. I think Benevolent Neglect's done a nice job. There's just the tiniest kiss of sugar our bar s layer just you know it's it's barely noticeable but but it's just enough to keep that um that acid in in check mm -hmm. i want to give a shout out to jancis too you might notice um you know steve's got his uh his jancis glass and by total coincidence i had actually grabbed the jancis glass to use for the tasting today too and so since we're both we're both using it i wanted to go ahead and give a shout out to her and um and thank her. It's a it's the perfect glass for three completely different wines. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, Favorite class right now. Let's go ahead and we're being a little speedy about it, but we do need to manage time. So let's go ahead and look at the second wine too. Yeah. When just one note on this Riesling is that what's is as it you know it's a California we, we we thought of as like a warmer region, but you do you're not getting really the kerosene in this wine. Yeah. This is really like pure fruit. Yeah, and, uh, and you know, so it's um, it was kind of, it's kind of surprising to me how how um, 
the you know yellow fruits it has as a you know it's not it doesn't come off as a warm climate riesling at all no i mean the a lot of the the riesling that i've had from mendocino shares that quality where like you're saying it's yellow fruits but kind of really firm um firm ripeness you know so early pick kind of ripe fruit um mm -hmm. yellow even kind of like peach skin in there and i i've i've seen that pretty consistently that you're not getting those kerosene notes in in Riesling from Mendocino. Some of that, I think, is how they chose to make this wine. They they were really thoughtful about doing a long, cool, slow ferment, which helps preserve a lot of those pure fruit notes and then also keep the aromatics too. Mm -hmm. So again, um, before we move on to the second wine, this first wine, it's uh, Benevolent Neglect 2018 Riesling. It is farmed by the Nelson family in Mendocino near Hopland. So let's go ahead and look at wine two. Do you want to hold up that bottle since you're on camera? So this is um, Keep Wines. It's their 2019 Cunois, which is pretty incredible, 2019 already. And this is actually a no added sulfur Cunois grown in the David Girard Vineyard, which is in the Sierra Foothills. So I love that we're getting multiple regions here. Um, but Cunois is, it's pretty unusual to, to get uh, Cunois really anywhere in the world, but there's a few few vineyards that have a little just enough that you could bottle it it's on its own and and so here's a really nice example of that you want to tell us about keep wines yeah so keep wines is um jack and johanna um they are jack has was our assistant winemaker for 10 years he just left um to just focus on keep wines full time just um a few months ago um he they're, they're just a wonderful family and um and they're really committed to making sort of like um, drinkable wines. Um, you know, he wants, they want to keep their costs down. They want to make wines that are, that are just quaffable and pure and clean and true and honest. Um, this, um, this is an interesting, this, you know, then, you know, because he's very much a craftsman, you know, I mean, the, the reason we worked together for 10 years was it's, it's not toss it, 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 it's unsulfur, but there's no funk here. It's very, they're very focused on making clean, pure um, wines where you can taste the variety in the place and, and, and in their case, doing it without added sulfur. So it, there's, there's a lot of attention to detail with this wine. The yeah, I, oh. no, I just, I'm really impressed with um, the kind of the detail and precision of this quinoise and especially like you're saying when you you have a no sulfur red it's easy for the wine to get kind of smudgy like maybe it'll stay clean but a, a lot of times a no sulfur wine will sort of lose some of that detail but this is just it's really just quite a gorgeous wine and i think it shows the um the like pixelated intricate flavors that you can get from elevation vineyards sometimes too you know, we were just in Paris right before the, the everything just melted down a couple months ago, and um, we were at a wine bar. They were had they had the Brock Cunois, um, who brought Chris Brockway is also a good friend, and it's also his, his Cunois is a beautiful wine. And I asked in the in the wine bar, they were just they were really excited about pouring a Cunois because it's not a common bridal anywhere else in the world to do as a standalone. Um, that's one of the great things about California is that we is that we since it, everything's wide open, we're, we, we don't have a long tradition. And yeah. so, but the tradition that we do have, 150 year tradition in California is, tends to be doing varieties that are not necessarily um, that common where they're, or they are as a single varietal. You know, we still have Charbono in Napa and I'm not sure that there's any Charbono anymore in Switzerland. Uh, I don't, Chasselis used to be more widely planted in Napa than Cabernet, if you can believe that. Yeah, so we've nice. always had a, this experimental tradition with varieties. And so the Cunois, there, there was a big push. Vandal Graham and a bunch of folks um, really rediscovered the um, California Rhone varietals, um, you know, 20, 30 years ago and started this whole Rhone movement. And um, so people started blending, trying to, you know, um, blending Rhone varietals and mostly Grenache, Syrah, Mouvet, and Cunois. Was, Grenache, Syrah, Mouvet are, are much more common, the California GSM. But Cunois was like the fourth one that people would put a little bit of it in. And so growers in some of these areas like the Sierra Foothills, um, which by the way is a five hour drive from Mendocino, just to put it in perspective with how yeah. big California is. Yeah. Um, the, in the Sierra Foothills, people would sort of 
um, growers would gamble and say, well, you know, like, you know, rather than try to fight it out in the commodity market with Merlot, why don't I plant a little bit of Kunwa's and then maybe I'll be able to sell that for a little bit higher price. And, and the, unfortunately the Rhone kind of craze kind of died down into a steady state. And so now you have these vineyards out there that people are, have, a, you know, 10 rows of Kunwa's and, right. and, and that's, and so it's been, this has been one of the varieties that people can prospect and find and, um, and explore. And it's, and it's something that's kind of uniquely Californian is to try to go after varietals and say, what is this? What is Kunwa's? Well, you and know. like, like you're getting at here too, there's, uh, there's actually very little Kunwa's in California. But there's there's little bits of it in a few different places. Generally, in outlying areas where um, the land the land prices are a little less, so it's easier to do a little more experimentation. But I love Kunwa's though. It's it's unusual to see it on its own. I think of it though as kind of it has a similar lightness and freshness as something like Sinso, uh, but it tends to be. A, there there tends to be a little more tension and a deeper tone like it's still very much a red fruit focus but a deeper toned notion of red fruit i think and um almost like fro a little bit of frozen cranberry you know that real like tight bright and verging on savory though so yeah. let's go ahead and let, we got to get on your wine <laughs> uh so you know steve was so great being willing to show other people's wines here uh, when I asked of him, but you know, we got to talk about his wine too. And so this is a, obviously a classic, sorry, but the lighting's a little awkward for the label, but um, you know, we are in Napa Valley. We want to talk about Cabernet Sauvignon. And, um, and so we're showing Steve's uh, 2016 um, Matthias in Napa Valley. And to be honest, I, I, I love this vintage. I, I en always enjoy your Cabernet but I just think of 2016 as really a perfect vintage for, for Napa. Um, it, you know, it's such an even year in terms of growing conditions. And you see that gorgeous balance of structure, precision, and then just delicious flavor in, a, in the 2016. Yeah, the, the um, I mean, Cabernet, we, we make about 25 different varietals at Matthias and we love the culture, horticultural tradition and all, you know, it's just, but we are in Napa Valley and, and Cabernet has been grown in Napa Valley for about 150 years. And it's something that we do really well here. And it's something that my other job of managing vineyards and consulting with the other wineries on their vineyard practices, I have a lot of experience with Cabernet and have developed over the years a very strong opinion about it and what it can be. Um, and, and so in our Cabernet, the idea is not to explore the 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 side of like raw power that the variety can do here grown here in Napa Valley but to really explore the the balance and the food aspects and the aromatic finesse that Cabernet also um, has as a part of its personality and so we harvest our Cabernet about probably six weeks before um, the majority of the valley gets going with harvest and we do a lot of things in the vineyard differently from the trellising I was describing to organic farming and crop load and light environment on the fruit and selections, the old selections, because we have some great old selections that in California that were brought over from France back in the, um, in the um, mid to late 1800s that are sort of very classic and old and more savory. So all of that kind of combining to be able to pick our fruit much earlier. Lower alcohol, this one is, um, this one is 13.3 on alcohol yeah. and um, yeah. red fruited, bright. You know, I still believe that the first um, responsibility of wine is to be refreshing because we have wine with food. And so, and refreshing isn't a term that is used anymore typically with Cabernet, but how can, can we achieve refreshing? Can we achieve brightness, lightness with yet with all of the flavor and layers that Cabernet can can give you and that that's the paradox is weight without heaviness that's that's our mantra is weight without yeah. heaviness well that's the thing I really love about about your Cabernet I, and I've said this to you before but I think of it as uh, wine with an open weave you know like if you think about different types of fabric you know the what you're offering in your Cabernet is is plenty of density and presence but then the weave is open enough to let the light in so you can really see the rain feel see and feel the range of flavors and have have that the room for that 
refreshing presence and the re the refreshment in in your cabernet it's not just coming from the acidity which is certainly there but again just that the dance of all these characteristics there's just enough palate tension just enough texture yeah. and um and then also the acidity so we sh we do need to start wrapping up i know someone asked earlier about the soils that you're dealing with there and it's a good opportunity i think to to come back again to the Cabernet because this is, um, if I remember correctly, your Napa Valley Cabernet, it's a blend of a couple different sites. Do you, so do you want to yeah. just quickly tell us what the soils from the sites you work with for this wine are? Okay, so um, so so the, we grow the Cabernet in other locations. The location that here at our house that I just showed you, you can see the soil is loamier and so that's that's not really suited to Cabernet. Where we are in the south part of the Napa Valley, it's a little cooler climate and you really need some rock and gravel drainage in order to get ripe, complete Cabernet. So where we're located, we're, um, we're on loamy soil. So our Cabernet is Rutherford. So Rutherford is further north. It's a very classic old, old Cabernet region, part of um, the Napa Valley that, um, no, I just got a warning that I got signed out. Am I still here? Yeah, I can still see you. Okay. Yeah, you're fine. My phone, my, the term is in my computer just said I was signed out. So anyways, Rutherford, you get the it's a warmer climate, nice gravelly soils next to the Napa River. So that gives you the that that more of that cranberry fruit and the and the little herbal characters because we pick it early. Coombsville is the other corner of Napa. It's an old volcanic caldera. So it's comp the soil is compressed volcanic ash, very rocky rhyolite and a kind of a gray color to the soil. And it's on top of a knoll. And so you get massive ripeness and power in that site. So we have to pick that. We have to be really careful that we don't over extract that site, but that's what gives the wine, the, the, the tannin structure and the dark fruits, the blackberry. And then we, and then here in Oak Knoll where we're located, but closer to the hills where it's gravelier, it's a, we have the morning fog coming off the bay and it's a slow ripening and you get the soft, luscious um, red fruits, you know, Bing cherry, and it's more, it, the Cabernet here is more Mer Merlot-like. And so mm -hmm. it gives, it's, it's the sort of soft middle of the wine. And so th those, these three zones are what really comprise this wine. That's part of the tradition of Napa Cab is blending yeah, the different blending. regions of Napa as Cabernet. Um, um, you know, so, Cabernet is a blending grape. Yeah, no, okay. absolutely. absolutely. One of the things too that somebody else just asked about um, was just the effects of climate change. And we talked about that briefly when we were looking at the vineyard with you, but, but could you comment a little bit on how, um, how you see climate change in changing the flavors of the wine? You know, obviously here with Cabernet, but, all, but other varieties you work with too, what, what changes do you see happening there? Well, um, I mean, if you, when you talk to some of the people that were making wine in Napa back in the 60s and 70s, the um, harvest dates have gone have moved about two months um, closer over the over the past 50 years um, and so you know the flavors have gotten right you know if, if the ability for ripeness has increased um, each year and so it's um, acidity so um, Napa Valley is a big valley and the cool air drains so we have a we, we traditionally have a warm days very cool nights it, it, most nights you have to put on a jacket even in the summer when you're sitting outside or and then in the day it'll be quite warm and that's our climate that, that holds the acidity those cold nights well the nights have been getting a bit warmer so we still have good acidity but we need to harvest earlier and we need to keep our fruit more covered with leaves in order to retain mm -hmm. that the freshness and the acidity that um, that we can achieve in the valley floor of the Napa Valley um, so the flavors, we, we have to be extremely careful about jamminess because the, if the fruit's exposed to the sun and we get a heat spike, the flavors will change to more of a cooked jam character. And we, yeah. but with that, with the cross arms on the trellis and more leaf, more leaf coverage, we can really, um, mitigate that. Um, if anything, it's an interesting thing about global warming is it's, it's pushed our viticulture to adapt. And I actually think our wines are more high toned red fruited aromatic now than they were 15 years ago just because we've gotten so much better at coping with the sun than than we than 15 years ago we didn't 15 years ago we were still of the belief that the more sun the better on the fruit so so as the climate changes viticulturally i think we've actually built ourselves a buffer because we've learned a lot about how to maintain flavor in, well in that's world. that's the thing like it's pushing people to really pay careful attention and and so the adjustments are happening in a way that's specific to that vineyard in that place rather you know 
as we've all been learning about viticulture, we've been able to hone it to really needs for a specific site, which is really exciting. One of the things that's important about how you're doing no-till too is it helps keep the soil temperatures cooler, which then helps change the way that the ripening curve happens over the course of the day as well on the vine. You know, so that's another thing that helps um, shift the, you know, it keeps everything under the canopy cooler, keeping the soils cooler keeps that cooler too. We're almost yep. out of time, but one of the things that uh, another person's asked about uh, different ripening times for different varieties. And so uh, as a broader way to answer that question, could you speak a little bit about how, when you know, the ripening time of a particular variety at different points in the season affect what you're paying attention to and what you're picking. So for example, Cabernet in comparison is harvested quite a bit later than Pinot, which is harvested relatively early. And that ends up changing both the temperatures in the day while during harvest, but also the arc of the light, uh, you know, over, over the length of the day during harvest. And so could you comment on how, um, how harvest times affect what you're paying attention to when to decide when to harvest and, and how that changes what shows up in the wine. Yeah, well, harvest times, I mean, the earlier you pick in the season, the, the um, longer your days are, the more light you have and the more heat units you're accumulating per day and the faster everything's moving. So we watch the weather like a hawk. Um, here in California, since we, aren't, we don't typically get rain during harvest, we, what we get are heat storms during harvest. So we watch for heat the way a, a, another region might watch for rain. And we, and we cannot let fruit that's almost ripe go through the heat or you're, you're in three day period, you could go from a 12% alcohol wine to a 14% alcohol wine, and it could go from red fruits to black fruits. So it moves really fast. And so we're watching, we watch the weather. We get it. If we have nice mild weather for 10 days, we might be able to let things go a little bit, but generally the, when you, if you're picking in early September, you have really one day that's your day to pick. If you're picking in late October, you might have a week span that is all pretty similar because things are just moving so much more slowly, assuming, yeah. assuming you're not getting rain. Right. Um, and, and, you know, you're watching acidity, you're watching sugar levels, but you're also watching flavors. You know, we're so focused on purity with our wines that the, that the flavors are really everything for us. And, 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 and there's the, as they go through the little waves of the green kind of does its thing, the red fruits do their thing, the black fruits do their thing, and you're looking for that one spot. And um, um, yeah, I mean, it's the biggest decision we make yeah. in the year by far. But I think that point though, that, you know, so if you're, if you're working with an earlier ripening variety like Pinot, you're also picking at a time when there's far more light over the course of the day and far more heat. And so you just got, you got to nail that harvest, you know, that versus day. Cabernet coming in generally later in September, well into October, depending on the vintage, you just have a little more relaxation about knowing when the decisions are because the days are already getting shorter and the heat is, is getting less too. So there are other questions that are more specific. Some of them we'll be able to actually answer in a follow-up email, but we are at a time, we went over a little bit even because it's, um, there's so many good things to talk about with Steve. And I'm, Steve, I just want to say I'm so grateful for you taking time out of your day and letting us see the vineyard with you and the Redwoods like this. And, and especially grateful for you picking these three wines and talking about the work other people are doing too. Thank you so much for making time with us. Thank you. And thank you everyone all around the whole world for, you know, supporting our California wines and and I hope everyone stays healthy and and your families and you somehow we we get through this and and maybe we, when we come out of this whole process maybe we're going to value our friends and our family and our food and our wine and our peaceful times even more highly and, and that'll be the silver lining out of this whole thing. Yeah and I I just want to say again having there were um there were so many countries represented here today, really truly from all over the world. Um, people from Japan even called in in the middle of the night to watch. They're supposed to be in bed, but, <laughs> but they're here with us right now. And, and I know the UK, um, India, Cameroon, uh, Ireland, Canada, um, Italy, France, Denmark, Netherlands, Germany. There's so many different countries here with us. Mexico um, has also several participants called in I am so grateful to all of you for being with us today. And I know, um, Katie, we wanted to go ahead and announce who we'll be doing this with next week. Would you like to jump in and, and let everybody know? 
Sure. So thank you again, Elaine and Steve. That was wonderful. Thank you for to all of our attendees. So next week, uh, we will it will be the same day, same time. So Tuesday, April 14th, 10 a.m. Pacific time. And Elaine will be speaking with Jasmine Hirsch of Hirsch Vineyards. Um, so we hope that you will join us then. And we're really excited to give you a glimpse of the far western coast of California. We're going to talk about what it's like to do mountain viticulture. Um, we'll get into talking about Pinot a little more specifically and, and also hear about, you know, a sense of old California with um, the work Hirsch did to establish vineyards in unknown places. So looking forward to seeing all of you then. Cheers, Thanks everybody. so much.